Hello and welcome to today's live stream. It is a pleasure to have you all here today so we can share a little bit of this project. So we can share a little bit of our experience running this project. And there's a, an interesting coincidence in that today is Favela Day. We did not know this beforehand, so this is a happy coincidence. But it is important for us because the favelas are an important part of the audience that we have served with this project. So this is called Empoderamenti, Critical Thinking, Awakening in Vulnerable Communities. What we're going to do here is to share a little bit the results of a research project that we developed in partnership between the Harriet Watt University in the UK, the UFG, the Federal University of Goiás, and in cooperation with the UKRI, the Tio Cleobaldo Association, the CUFA, and Uniforte. We also rely on the support with String and Can Multilingual Online, who has been helping us with interpretation throughout the project. This project was only made possible because of the support of the UKRI, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is a British uh, research institution that has helped us in this project as well. So because we have a bilingual live stream today, there's a little bit of housekeeping to do. I want to let you know that this is also being shared in YouTube, both in Portuguese and in English. And for those of you who are following this online, please remember that we're also doing this over Zoom. For the moment, you're probably only hearing my voice if you're listening to Portuguese. But at some point, we're going to have English speakers who will be presenting. And you're going to be need to use the interpretation function. So I'm now going to give the floor to Lara so Lara can explain to us how to use the interpretation function. Laura, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. My apologies. Welcome. I'm going to start in English. Uh, this event will be interpreted. Let's get everyone on the correct channels. So to access the interpretation on a computer, you're going to go to your meeting controls at the bottom and click on the globe. Then click on the language you'd like to hear. If you're on a phone, and there we have the visual. If you're on a phone, you also go to your meeting controls at the bottom, click on the three dots, more and then tap language interpretation and the language you'd like to hear and then click done. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or participate via voice, make sure and grab a headset with a microphone so that you can be interpreted accurately. Um, and now I'm going to do the same thing in English. To access interpretation in your computer, please click the interpretation globe on the lower uh, uh, border of your screen on the meeting controls. Click the globe icon called interpretation and then click the language you will issue here. If you're connecting from a cell phone, click on the bottom of your cell phone in the icon that's called more, then language interpretation, then choose the language you'd like to hear. If you wish to speak, it is very important that you wear a headset with a microphone. And with that, I now give the floor back to Michael. Michael, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Laura, for the clarifications. And if you're having difficulties accessing the interpretation, please let us know in chat so that we can uh, help you out so you can use it. Moving on then, what's our agenda for today? I'll begin by talking about what my motivations and uh, objectives are for the project. Then I'll talk about our team, the places where we uh, perform the activities of the research project, our methodology and methods, the results, including initial interviews, conversation circles, the game, and training and multiplication efforts. Then we do, we'll talk about briefly the impacts of the project. We'll get to know the website. And finally, we're gonna have a little QA session. Okay, so now to talk about the first item on our agenda, the motivation, I'm going to invite Claudia to take the floor. Claudia is the principal researcher on the British side of this project. And Claudia, feel free to make use of the floor. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you everybody for joining us today. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure and honor to be able to do this. And thank you interpreters ahead of time. So I basically, um, I'm going to summarize for us what what was the, the um, what triggered this project? As we will know during COVID-19, uh, the abundance of fake news was undermining local efforts to help the most vulnerable communities. And so in a way we needed to understand um, how is it that people pay attention to certain um, news, to certain uh, instructions and not to others? Where do they place trust, etc.? cetera? So um, that, that is how is fake news undermining those mitigation efforts among vulnerable groups in metropolitan areas of Brazil. And we were delighted to have our partners with us uh, trust us and give us entry so that we could do this in the communities that you're going to see in a minute. Um, so we look at um, what communicative strategies we could design that would be uh, useful for, um, for us to understand how we place trust, how we believe or we don't believe in, in certain pieces of news. And for that, it was important to start developing, enhancing uh, these abilities of critical thinking that allow us to sort a, a fact from, from a fake fact. And, and Michael, if I could have the next slide, please. So basically the project had different goals that we uh, met during the 12 months that we have been working together and we continue to work together for five more. So we first identified the type of information that was available, that is available to communities, how communities access it, how they select what kind of information they're going to be paying attention to. We explored how participants place trust, in whom they play trust, they place trust, if it's in neighbors, if it's in family, if it's in um, figures of authority. And from the observations that we did, we wanted to use that information to tailor and implement um, a model of critical thinking that will allow us to to be able to assess that information that we are getting. And so the part of the project was also to explore different uh, technologies that would assist us in doing that, different approaches. And we, um, the goal was to empower the communities by becoming critical consumers of information. And we believe that um, if we take into account social factors and we observe the communities and we engage the community members with us, then we are all participating together. And this is how we develop the best strategy because it's coming from the people that are using it. And we established in so doing, we established networks with communities. And our goal is also to design um, a method that can be then replicated in other areas of Brazil, in other places, in other favelas, in other uh, cooperatives, shelters, but also in other countries. So by explaining exactly why we did what we did and um, 
and leaving a roadmap, others can capitalize on this project too. Thank you, Michael. Next slide, if, if you wish. It's So I'll, I'll give Michael the floor in a minute. Let me introduce briefly the Harriet Watt team. Or Mario, you, Michael, you can do it. The floor is yours then. Yeah. No, no, feel free to present the British team and then I'll present the Brazilian team. It's okay, we can share. Okay, so you can, you can pass on my picture. You can see me here as the principal investigator for the project and um, really blessed to have had this great team. Um, if, as you see in the next slide, we can see um, research assistance we got from Ghana being the artist that you're going to see in a minute, all illustrations she's done for the game and Jane who worked with me in the development of critical thinking materials for workshops and Elith who is um, looking at writings now that we are doing and Christian as um, aiding with project management. Thank you very much, Michael. The floor is yours now to introduce the Brazilian team and all our collaborators. Thank you, Claudia. In the Brazilian side, the team has me as a co-lead of the project on the Brazilian side. We also have Professor Sheisa from the School of Communication of the UFG. We've also had Alberto, who helped us a lot with field research. Mauricio, Lucas, and Diane, who performed the same function at different moments, which namely is to help us both develop activities and as translators. All of them help translate our materials between Portuguese and English. This is because not all Brazilians in the project understood Portuguese and not all, sorry, understood English and not all British uh, members of the project or UK members of the project understood Portuguese. So we had that bridge. And we also had the people you see right now that we call the local researchers. Who are they? Those are people who work at the three associations you see on the slide and they helped with the project. Tio Cleobaldo, is an organization that helps us with people um, who live on the streets or the homeless uh, community. We've also had Edvan and Raisa from KUFA, this unified federation of favelas, who helped us work in two different communities. And Uniforte also helped us. And we have it. Uh, we had Lorena and Daniel, both members of Cooperama a way speakers cooperative that, and they both helped us with our project activities as well. And of course, we also relied throughout the activities of the project as we held our meetings from our interpreters, Elena and Daniel, who you're actually going to be hearing today. So they've been present in our meetings. They've really facilitated our activities and made us easier to communicate. And we also sought to design a lot of illustrated work for a project to help us disseminate it. And for that, we relied on the support of Luis Fernando Casso. He is a professional illustrator and he helped us by bringing a more uh, playful perspective or more playful outlook to the materials we developed. So this is basically how our team uh, makeup is. On the top, we had two universities. And like I said, both of the teams were not necessarily all equally fluent in English or Portuguese. And whenever those uh, lacked, we resorted to Spanish because our, uh, Claudia is from Argentina. So we tried to find some form of understanding between Portuguese and Spanish to try to understand each other. And at the same time, on the Brazil side, we were coordinating work with the communities we work with. Our meetings with Harriet Watt were all online. We communicated via the internet to develop materials. Once finished or once we had uh, them ready enough, we submitted them to our local researchers so that they could give us feedback on whether the material made sense to them or didn't. 
they talk to us from the communities saying, hey, this is what we think should be changed. This is how we think you could adapt the material to be more connected to the reality of the people we see every day. And these exchanges are what led to the activities of our project. So we had this feedback from all these directions. Uh, and as you can see in the arrows, the local researchers were also talking to each other from the local researchers working on different sites, also talks among themselves. And we had feedback going in all these directions you see here pointed out by the arrows, working across languages, across cultures, across perspectives. And it was really an interesting work method that we implemented to be able to run this project. So in terms of the field activities, when we were working to make sure that we were being effective, we decided to choose specific communities for us to work with. We worked specifically in the municipality of Goiania in the center of Brazil, as you can see in the arrow. And we worked on five different sites. The one is we worked on the Colono Joaquin Lucio Square, the Casa da Corrida Cidadan, or Citizen Shelter Home, Cooperama, which is a waste pickers cooperative, and two marginalized communities, two uh, urban agglomerates here in the municipality of Coyonia, what you would call favelas, or we would call favelas, sorry. And to now, so that we can talk about these sites, I will talk, I will ask my colleagues, my local researchers, to talk about the experiences on those sites. And I'll now ask Joviniano and Maila to talk about their work on the Colonel Joaquin Lucio Square. So Maila and Joviniano, feel free to take the floor to talk about your experience at the square. So you have to turn on your mic, unmute yourself, Maila. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be part of this research project. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this park. It's in the section of Campinas in the city of Guayana. And it's a very commercial part of town, a lot of stores and manufacturers. It's a small park, but it is the part where the most people who are experiencing homelessness gather. We have people who are suffering from alcoholism, drug addiction, also children, and they participate in several groups. And so the Tio Cleobaldo Association delivers food twice a week, about 200 meals, including water and dessert as well, in addition to the meal. And also when the person wants to leave the street or wants to go for treatment, then they'll also take them in for that. We also help them get a job. We might help them with rent money. And we have some legal help that we can offer as well and medical help. So we give them a whole series of support at this park, João Lucio. And so now Giovanni is gonna talk about the shelter, which is a continuation of this park and what we the services that we provide at the park. Joviniano, go ahead, the floor is yours. So this is Laura. I don't see him in the list. If he's here, is he here? He's named as Jean. Oh, okay. Go he's ahead, Jean. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, everyone. The shelter is regulated by the mayor's office. It's also in that same region of Campinas in the city of Guayana. And it provides a shelter for families and individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So it's a place that, it's a temporary shelter. It's the city that offers this. And we also offer food. 
And there's also psychological support and people will be referenced um, to other professionals and also helped in terms of finding a job. Thank you, Jean. And so the other place where we carried out our research is at Copa Rama. And I'm gonna invite Lorena and Danielle to talk a little bit about Copa Rama and the work that they do there so that you have that context. Go ahead, Lorena, the floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And so Koparama is a cooperative. We have about 30 members that work at this cooperative and it's people who gather waste. It's people that either are undereducated or have been un under or unemployed. And this is a place where they can make money and support their families. As Maila was saying, this is also people who might have had problems with addiction or alcoholism in the past, or they need help finding a place to live. And so we can provide some social services for them. It's also a place for them to have digni dignified work, for them to have financial support for their families. Thank you, Lorena. The next place that we're going to introduce, uh, introduce is Buena Vista. And I'm gonna invite Raisa to talk a little bit about this community. Raisa, are you here? Maybe she's having a connection problem, but I can talk about it. So this neighborhood, Buena Vista, is a new neighborhood in the city. You can see it's kind of on the margins of the city. It's really on the periphery of the city of Goiânia. And so the city, the municipal government provided housing. And so there's a lot, there's not a lot of infrastructure in this part. There's no streets in some places. There's not sewage services yet in some of the places. And there's also some challenges for the residents, which is that they work quite far away. So if, if you work downtown, it's very far to get to Buena Vista. It's two or three hours on public transportation to get downtown from Buena Vista. There's a lot of vulnerable people in this area. There's even some makeshift shacks in this area. And during the pandemic, it's been especially hard for people who live there. The other location that we worked in is Villa Lobo. So I'm going to invite Ediva to the floor so that he can talk a little bit about Villa Lobo. Go ahead, Ediva. The floor is all yours. Edvan, can you turn on your camera? I turned on your mic for you. Yeah, I'm trying to turn my camera on. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be participating in this project. I'm the leader at KUFA in Villa Lobo. So we provide assistance in that neighborhood. We provide food, cleaning, hygiene services, sanitary services. So this is in the south part of the city, in the south part of the city of Guayana. And I think it's called 
Villa Lobo because it used to be a farm. And then when the city started growing, it quickly arrived at this region. They started building up different areas around there. And so now we were surrounded by buildings. And so people started taking over this area. And I think there was a little stream. So now there's this little creek that we have. And that creek would, where it ran, it would form almost a little alleyway. And I think that's where the name comes from. People don't like that name. because there was a lot of violence in that area. There was a lot of crime, a lot of violence. So they don't, they associate the name with that past. But now, of course, that area is occupied legally. And so they're trying to call it Jardin Goyaz, which is kind of the most noble part of the city. That's where the court is. There's a lot of municipal offices. Whereas in Villa Lobo, these houses are very tightly arranged. They don't have a lot of infrastructure. They're very small houses. It's an impoverished population that lives there. That's why we provide a lot of services. The biggest question that we see there really is the crime rate. It is somewhat high, uh, especially with regard to drugs. And with the pandemic, it's been even worse. So that's Villa Lobo for you, which we're now calling Jardin Goyaz. Thank you, Edvan. Oh, you're welcome. So those were the initial places where we carried out our visits. We had a diagnosis with the local researchers so that we would know what our communication strategy could be. And then we designed our research project. And so now Claudia is going to explain a little bit about our methodology for this research. Thank you very much, Michael. So in order to get answers to our questions, we designed the following strategy. We started paying attention and observing, getting to know the community, understanding the diversity, the groups that, that um, were collaborating with us are very different. So we were not to assume that vulnerable communities in a cooperative, in um, homeless shelters, in um, favelas are going to be reacting in the same way or having the same needs. So by observing, taking notes, we were getting to know them. Everything we did, we did it through um, action research and participatory action research, meaning uh, research, a study that is meaningful to society, that's socially committed. And so that meant the blending of um, academic researchers and community leaders, who are there, they understand their community and they are researchers and scientists in other ways. And we came together and we took one work um, kind of like the mirror of the other. So we began to learn more about the community through the community leaders. The community leaders began to understand more of this research design uh, through us. And so it was a, a very symbiotic relationship that we had. And um, with the material that we were collecting and getting to know people, that was the basis, doing initial interviews, um, doing observations to start towards what is on the right hand side of the slide, which is based on, on, on information we received. So really driven by data, not by what we thought was necessary. We designed this communicative strategy around, and we'll be talking later in detail about this, but around um, six, sessions getting together that we called five of them conversation or circles so that people will start working on critical thinking but not in a classroom type rather 
um, in a round where conversation was leading um, the um, what we were going to be learning and we were learning from each other experiences. The materials for those conversational circles were also based on community needs. And so the the five sessions on critical thinking were then followed by a sixth session on a game, what we call a serious game, an educational game. And in addition to consolidating skills in a more playful way, we continued the communicative strategy so that it would continue to live on when the project stop. Our goal really in, in building this strategic alliance with local researchers, with community leaders, is that uh, the project survives the time when the project has to, to be working on, the time of the grant. So that, that's our goal. And um, that meant that a key, um, a key part of our project was the local researchers. The local researchers are key because they are they are on site, they will continue the project, and we are very, very grateful to the fact that we could work together from training each other. Um, we were understanding the communities, the research, um, the local researchers were understanding our methodology and why we wanted to go this way. So this gives us a panoramic view of the project. I hope um, now we are going to be slicing the process into putting the, the, the spot in each of these steps. And of course, in order to measure gain, we, we tested um, all participants at the beginning and at the end of these six sessions to see if really there was a change in the way they approached decision-making. Thank you, Michael. We can have the next slide, Michael, if you know. And that's Geisha, right? Thank you, Claudia. So now we're gonna talk about the activities that we actually carried out. So I'm gonna invite Geisha, and she's gonna talk about this phase of our research project, these initial interviews. Good morning. I think I have a problem with my camera. My camera doesn't want to turn on. So that's okay. You'll just hear my voice. At this point, uh, later on, I'll come, try to come in with my phone. So this initial, initial phase of the project was what we call the diagnostic phase. At first, we needed to understand so that we could develop both the communicative strategy and the game, everything that we needed to develop in the community. And we needed to understand the context of each of these groups. What was their daily life like? What was their relationship with information? Especially given that we were going through a pandemic. Another very important aspect of this project that really related to everyone was, again, this relationship with the local researchers. They were able to work closely with us. And I think that was really important for them too. They saw how we carried it out. And these are people who deal with the reality of the communities on a daily basis. So it's very important for these local researchers to be present and for them to get information and to share information. So they were part of this initial diagnosis. We also had some ethnographic observations that we carried out at this initial time, kind of our notes and our perceptions of these communities. And here you see some photos. First, we started with the conversation circles. We we talked to them first. It was a really great experience. In Buena Vista, for example, most of the women who are participating were women. We also carried out activities at Villa Lobo and at the cooperative. So this was just the first contact that we also did like a conversation circle. It's almost like a focus group. We had some discussions conversations so that we could understand how people deal with information. 
but was the relationship that they had with their families and information. And the questions that guided us along the way were to understand what's the context of the community, what are the characteristics or traits of each community. And we were able to get that also from the local researchers who are there on a daily basis. We were also looked at what were the sources of information that these people were selecting and accessing, how they were consuming information. This is very important. And I will, I will speak more about it, um, about a questionnaire that we applied as well to find this out. We wanted to know how they evaluated information as well and what, how they attributed trust to some sources and not to others, how they made decisions and all of that within the context of the pandemic. And so that we could understand these general characteristics. And we also wanted to know what barriers they might have had against doing a critical evaluation of information. And from that understanding, we were able to understand what the needs were of each group. So what were the communicative needs of each group? And that's how we came up with the strategies and what we would apply so that we could develop them in a more effective way and based on the reality of these people. We didn't wanna carry anything out that didn't have to do with the reality of the communities where we were working. So at this first phase, we had to understand this context. We had these conversations with everyone. We had some initial interviews as well. So we went to Koparama, we went to the park with Tio Cleobaldo, we went to Buena Vista. In Buena Vista, we actually went into people's homes and that's when we did that initial interview. Hmm. I think we went to 16 homes, we visited people's homes and we did the same in Villa Lobo. So this was a very important moment. And we had an interview guide. But ideally, they were open-ended interviews. We wanted people to talk openly. We had some guiding questions about COVID. We talked about their fam asked about their families, how they were doing, and the information and how they accessed information. And so with that, we were able to understand some of these important categories. And for example, we were able to understand what their beliefs were around COVID-19, what care they took with their family around the virus. A lot of them were not favorable toward the vaccine in the beginning, but then changed their minds with time. So we were really looking at information in the daily context of these people and how they consumed information, how they understood information. And then we had the question questionnaire that was about the information sources. And that questionnaire helped us look at social media. And we understood that really Facebook and WhatsApp were the two social media networks that people were using the most and where they were looking for the most information. And also TV. TV and family were still very important and the, so one of the preferred methods for consuming information. And a lot of those are related to journalistic sources. The two TV stations that were most used were Heiji Global and Record. And they also said that TV, news sites, and family were the sources that they most trusted. We carried out this questionnaire in Buena Vista and Villa Lobo, and also at Coparama. For those that were experiencing homelessness, it was a little bit different of an experience. 
But from those other three communities, we had somewhat of an idea. Because people who are experiencing homelessness, people associated with Tio Cleobaldo, it's harder to talk to them about how do they access information because they don't have a lot of information at their fingertips. And a lot of the information that they do have was passed on from the people that work at Tio Cleobaldo or perhaps that come from other people that are experiencing homelessness. But the information takes a certain amount of time to arrive at them. They're not, they don't have television, cell phones, internet all the time. So that was a very interesting thing to see too, to understand those differences and see what their relationship was with information. Because we didn't know how they were getting information. And I think Myla could even talk about that more with more detail later on. So that was our, our initial diagnosis. And so now I think maybe someone else can speak, Lorena, or someone else can speak more about that. They can talk about that initial approach that we had at the cooperative. Lorena, feel free to, uh, feel free to use the floor and Danielle as well. Oh, hi, they're both speaking at the same time. Hello, good morning, everybody. The beginning of the research project was a bit different for us as well. We were quite surprised with the variety of opinions we'd heard from the people we work with. We actually had no idea some of them had the opinions they showed us. We were really, really surprised about how much they, th there was variability among the opinions we'd heard. And at the end, we also saw they were able to find a common ground and compatibilize their opinions, if I may use a, a, a neologism here. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Lorena, would you like to say anything? My apologies, but I couldn't hear what Daniel said. It was mute here. But Lorena, if you'd like to come in, go ahead. In the beginning, they were a bit hesitant. They were a bit embarrassed. Basically, they never saw Michael, they never saw Shaysa before, so it was all new to them. But little by little, we became closer and it was easier for them to share what they thought. And actually, we saw a lot of opinions change regarding vaccination. A lot of them said they wouldn't take the shot, but once they had the opportunity, a lot of them actually ended up getting vaccinated, indeed. Many of them actually saw things on TV and then asked us to clarify them. The, and some of them actually asked to do some research for them. So this has been really interesting. And it is being interest in a way because we're continuing to research project. So it was very cool to be able to see how their mindsets changed and how prevalent misinformation is. It really showed us how easily some misinformation or some facts, quote unquote, arrived to them that weren't really facts. Things that were just not right and the things that they initially believed. And when they talked to us, they saw that they were really not true. I saw a lot of that happen. After the session, some of the people approached me to talk and we saw a lot of that as well. And overall, it's been a good ride. Actually, we're uh, now continuing this project without the direct assistance of the research team. And we're actually feeling quite comfortable, even a little bit more comfortable now because we have a more intimate relationship with the participants and their content. And it was a very positive experience to have with you and the people in the sessions. Thank you, Lorena. So yes, as you could hear, this was the initial stage of our research project. As you saw, the 
we initially began the project, we did the initial interviews, me and Jayza, as the academic part of the project. And then the local researchers came in. Now, without our presence, exclusively leading these sessions, without our presence in them. So I'll now give the floor to Claudia, so Claudia can talk about the conversation circles, how they were planned, how they were led. Jayza will talk a little bit about that as well. And then Raisa and Ed Van will talk about their own perceptions of the activity. So Claudia, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. So um, as, as we have heard, the project could not have happened without this team. And when Michael was showing how we work together and was explaining how we work through different languages, different cultures, uh, different countries, and also from a distance, everything was mediated by this computer. But we worked together from day one. So when we think about the conversation or circles, the first thing that we think is, we needed the information from those initial interviews. We discussed guides that would lead conversations because we were interested in obtaining information about the community and understanding what sources they trust or they used. And when, once we had that information and we started developing the materials to use in the conversation circles, we began to work together with local researchers. So with the help of interpreters and when interpreters were not with us, using translanguaging, as, as Michael explained, using Spanish and Portuguese and English, the text would be in English, but we were discussing in Spanish and Portuguese. So language in the form of translation, interpreting, or any type of translanguaging was very central to our project. And with the input from the local researchers, we were constantly drafting and changing the materials that we were bringing to each of these meetings. But basically, these five weeks always had three things that repeated week by week with different materials and increasing, if you wish, in levels of difficulty. The first part was to always be um, in tune with creating trust. So the very first part of, of the workbooks would always be about activities in which we had to approach a neighbor, a friend, the person sitting next to us and discuss different things from, from our favorite hobbies. To, so it wasn't anything substantial at the very beginning, while at the very end, the same kind of activity designed to um, create bonding and, and learn trust we switched from in where would you have a picnic with your family by by a river or in the forest or we switched from that to if you were given a choice with the vaccine or if somebody's saying x or y would you believe it and why so we moved from from um from simple activities to more complex ones the second goal within the workshop was to um, develop critical thinking. So in order to develop critical thinking, we were asking questions and the participants had to justify their answers and had to bring evidence on their answers. So for example, if it was about, would I do a, a barbecue with my family or a feijoada, which one would I privilege? It wasn't just feijoada because I like it most, but it was about why would you go for this choice? And so participants began to engage with how many people we could, we could feed if we are doing one thing versus the other, etc. So there was always a justification for a decision, which is a, the very basic stage of developing critical thinking. And there was also the opportunity as a, as a third part of reflecting and carrying forward what we learned in the conversation circle to homes and to our neighborhood and to the people we love, families and friends, so that there was a constant reflection on starting now to approach information and look at information from a different angle. Before it could simply be, it's there, it's on the radio, it's on the TV, probably it's true, or I'll do it because, because they say so. Whereas now it was, make a point, say something, 
but give us the evidence and evaluate the evidence. So if I say I'm going to wear a mask, it's not just enough to say, yes, I'm going to wear a mask. It's why would you wear it? And let's say, because I believe that in this way, I'm not uh, contaminating others. Or I'm not, so there's always, I make a point and I show the evidence, but the evidence can be faked or real. So we evaluate the evidence. And that became like a, a mode in which people would always be trying to do that with every piece of information they got. So as I was saying before, um, the the sessions, the conversational circles became more and more difficult. And Michael, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so you see here, for example, we are going to have uh, a get together and we would like to know um, uh, if, if we have to do a, a community activity or something with somebody else, who would we choose and why? So again, it cannot be because it's my friend, but what does it mean to be a friend? Is there trust involved, etc.? So this is the second type of activity. And every week, as I said, there were different types. And so we'll move forward, Michael, please, with the next slide. And we'll see how we were basing the slide. Um, here we see wonderful illustrations from our local artist, and this is week three, so it's the middle of those five weeks, and it's where we have a story, and the story presents a problem that has to be solved, and we may all have different opinions. Basically, you can see Alice, the, the, the protagonist who wants to go and visit her lover, the bridge was washed away by the river and she needs to use this little boat and the captain is not ready to offer her a ride if it's not getting something in return. And the something in return ends up being spending the night together. So for Alice to get to her lover, she had to spend the night together with this captain. And we have several characters in the story and the participants in the workshop have to list the characters in order of the, the better or the, 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 the worst one and always justify why. So we're engaging in a story where, of course, we may have different opinions, but the important thing is for us to justify the opinions. Michael, if I can go to the next slide, please. This is what captures then the activities becoming more and more difficult. Um, it's a way of thinking, a way of, of looking at all the um, skills that we have and, and the ability we have to do things with our mind. So it started the very basic one, which is to remember. So we all remember, we may not say we are critical because we remember, but we move from remembering to understanding to applying that new knowledge that we understand to something new, to something different, to analyzing what it means. Remember when we said people make a point and they have to explain it and they have to offer evidence and they have to evaluate the evidence being real and not fake. And so then it's also emulating and creating something new. So when we are discussing COVID-19, how does the same way of thinking transfer to, let's say, making a decision at home with education of children or um, applying for funding uh, from the government to get help with something. How is that going to work for us or not? And how, and, and how we go about doing it. So it's transferring these abilities from an exercise to real life all the time, to really become, to engage with the things we read or we hear, but to engage very critically so that we don't just consume information, we decide which one serves our purposes or we can trust and which one we cannot. Michael, could I have the next slide, please? So this gives us an idea, this is week five. So if you remember week one, it was, it was very, very gentle getting into critical thinking. Now we have had discussions on COVID-19. 
We have had in week four experiences with well health care organization, use of masks, etc. So now this activity is going to go over some issues that have been reported by the organization, the World Health Organization, and it's asking participants to analyze what they are reading using the little table that we saw before with the arrows going up, that, that it starts with remembering, but it goes all the way up. So they were applying that, that way of analyzing things to their the real issues that they are experiencing in their lives. And so I think that in this way, we got an idea of what the materials that we produced for the participants based on their own needs uh, were taken to the field. And we will see in the next pictures, Jaysa and Maiko and Erevan, the local researchers implementing this. You see here around the table how they are working. Some exercises called for them to work individually. Others call for them to work in pairs with a person sitting next to them and others in big, bigger groups. And you can see how people engaged and they were then thinking of taking this back home and sharing with the family. So it was a really wonderful experience to see that um, we were kind of closing a circle where it starts with the participants and their needs expressed in these initial interviews that Geisha described. And then we are recycling those, we are using those thoughts and experiences to create materials that then are coming back to the site to participants and local researchers to engage with them. And this now becomes a new source of data for us. Now we have how things are being done, not only what worries them and what news do, do they get from where, but now it's how, how we are processing thoughts and, and ideas and how we can process them a little bit different also by learning new things. So I'll, I'll stop here, Michael, and give the floor to, to Jaysa or to, before we get into the game, which is closing the sixth week. And for that, Diane has the floor. So I don't know how you organize it. Thank you. Jaysa, Edivan, Haissa, if you want to speak, go ahead. Okay. Ernest, could you see if you could turn on my camera? Because people will see me, because I do have my cell phone on now. So Claudia, as Claudia presented to you, this was the material that we developed for the conversation circles. Our intention was to see how people made decisions, their individual decisions, their collective decisions, and also what else was surrounding those de that decision making. And so these workshops, we called them workshops in the beginning, and then we started calling them conversation circles because that's more from a dialogue perspective. They were developed in each site that we worked at. All the material that we produced was based on the context of these communities. At first, of course, people seemed very shy to participate. And then with time, they loosened up. They started making friendships in the group and trusting each other more. And they started trusting us more as well. And so we really learned a lot through these conversation circles in each community. These conversation circles, again, are a dialogue. They're based on dialogue. They're based on listening to each other. They're based on respecting several opinions and different points of view. And it's about making individual and collective decisions. Uh, 
and seeing what impact an individual decision can have on the others. So in Buena Vista, for example, uh, most participants were females. And the women really had a strong family connection, a lot of effective connections with their families. And that kind of modeled, set the model for their decision making, both individually and in groups. That caring, that sense of caring for their families really was seen and reflected in their decision making that they applied during these conversation circles. At Koparama, they did not trust us in the beginning. It was similar. And then over time, they started trusting us more and loosened up. There were some difficulties in terms of the dynamics on site, but it was very interesting to carry out this work. It was very positive. It was really cool. I think everywhere we went, people were really happy. And so this is a dynamic for that has to do specifically with this cooperative. Uh, people here are receiving a salary based on what they produce on a daily basis. So for them to participate in these meetings and not be able to work, that could result in a financial loss. But Lorena did an amazing job with them. Dulce and Danielle carried this out. And they talk to them about the importance of not working, of stopping, taking a break from work and participating in these workshops and spending that time. So it's very interesting. And it was really cool. And it was really interesting to understand the dynamic of those sessions to, so that we could apply that in other places with other people. You know, in Villa Lobo, Buena Vista, and at the park. Thank you, Jason. So, Ediva or Raisa, do you want to talk about a little bit from your point of view what it was like to carry out the activities, these conversation circles? I don't know. Yeah, if you want to later on, you can you can contribute later on if you want to. Maybe there's a technical problem. So now I'm going to invite Diane to speak a little bit to use a different tool, which was the educational or serious game. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Diane, and I worked with developing and applying the educational game. And this was the final stage of those six encounters that Claudia presented so well. So one of the things is we want to think about like, why a game? What's, why is a game relevant to this kind of research? When we think about games, we usually think about games as something that people do to have fun. But here we had a different goal. We wanted a to have a process that would add to the experience that these people had already been working on for the last five weeks. As Claudia talked about, there was a progression of the activities, activities so that people would develop critical thinking. And this educational game came at the end of that so that we could take advantage of all the skills that they might have learned and see if they could apply them in a real setting. Because before then, they were filling out things in notebooks, they were talking. But with a game, they could leave that immediate context, go into a more informal setting, have discussions, and then apply it in the game. So what we chose was an RPG, role-playing game. And that's where the player takes on the role 
of someone else. That's why it's role playing. And we wanted to also have some elements of a card game or a board game. We wanted these characters to be in that environment, but they would have some cards and images to help them along. And they could develop their creativity in this ludic or entertainment environment. Another thing was to have a relationship between the player and the narrative. We wanted people to engage with the game, with the story, and see what they would get from it and think about what it would add in terms of their critical thinking. That, those were our priorities. So this game was developed with several materials. We had a book for the facilitator, almost like an instruction booklet or a handbook. And this is for people who can ap want to apply this game in the future so that they know what the narrative is like and how you play the game. Then we also had a storybook that would take that told the basic narrative. Um, we had 51 cards. I'm going to show that to you a little bit later. And we gave the participants, the players, those cards so that they would have something tangible during this narrative process. Because, of course, it's hard to get into a fictional universe if you don't have something uh, physical there. If you can't, you know, they need something to visualize it so that they could see what each player, uh, what each role, each character was. And then we also had four posters with scenery. And then we had a, a box. And that box stored everything. So that was also part of our materials. In terms of the narrative, it's a very simple narrative. But it does have a very interesting degree of complexity. It follows a group of Brazilian folklore characters. And that's Sassi, Caipora, Curupira, Wirapuru, the river dolphin. And they're in an indescript forest and they're trying to fight a they're trying to fight a blight in the forest and we wanted to have characters that were familiar to brazilians and so that's why we that's why we developed the game with these folklore characters and why did we talk about a blight well we wanted to talk about COVID-19 and how it impacts our reality. And so that's, we brought in this idea of a blight in the florist so that people could really reflect on illness in real life and how we can find solutions to it. So real situations in a Players have to make a decision in this game. They have to make a medication or they have to ask help from someone who is of questionable morality. So that's the basic narrative of the story is to put these players in a fictional environment, present a conflict to them, very basic conflict, very big direct conflict. There's an illness and you need to resolve it. And we gave them solutions. Either you can put together some kind of medicine that is probably safer, or you could go to a character that you don't quite trust. You're not really sure. And we wanted to see what people were going to do with that. And it was very interesting to see how the participants who had taken all those workshops, they had learned all those skills, had all those tools, how they would resolve this problem. So this is just to show you some of those scenery cards that we created. This is the forest. And we give this to them during the game narrative so that they can visualize what the forest looks like, what the context is, and what they're doing there. It's very interesting because it creates a connection with the material or visual aspect of the story.
I think it's much more powerful when you have an image. So you have a you have the narrative plus the visuals. That's very powerful. Here we have two of the characters. So this is Yayaga and Kuka. Ayanga is not such a well-known character, even in Brazil. But Kuka on the right side, uh, the alligator is super well-known in Brazil. Everyone knows who Kuka is. So we had some very well-known traditional folklore characters with other folklore characters that were not as well-known. And this was an add-on for a lot of these a lot of the participants, they were like, oh, I didn't know about that character. Now I know. And they said so they were, they were excited about it. And that was neat to observe. Here are the playing cards that we developed. And um, Anna Vorzinkova designed these. She illustrated them. They each have the different characters, Kaipora, Kurupira, Yara, and Botu, who are the two river dolphins. There's male and female. And that was just to give that option of different gender. And then Sassi, Terere, and then Wira, Puru. So they would, they would choose what character they wanted to be. Some people were shy or about if people were shyer about picking them, then we would kind of encourage them and say, oh, why don't you be this one or that one? So that's the first step. And here are more playing cards that were created for skills and knowledge. And we had more cards, but we just wanted to show you some of them. Each character had a strength, a weakness, and a specific trait. So strengths and weaknesses and something that it can contribute to that group. This is important because the players in the game were in a group, and we wanted them to talk amongst themselves and reflect on what the skills of their characters and the weaknesses and the strengths of their characters could contribute to the solution. And that's what we wanted. We wanted people to talk, that they, we wanted people to get out of their comfort zone and expand their knowledge. And that's why we created these cards. Because they would say, they would have to say, well, I can contribute with this, but I have this weakness. And another person might be able to point out, oh, but you could contribute this to us. And so that way they would, could come up with a solution to resolve the conflict. So here is the game being played. And Myla and Michael, if you want to speak, you could talk about your experience um, carrying out the game, playing the game. Thank you, Diane. If we could spotlight Myla and Jean. So this was the game that we carried out in all the different settings. And so when people were picking their character, in Villa Lobo, for example, there was a black woman who said, oh, I want to be Sassi because Sassi represents me. You know, this would be a character that would better represent her in real life. So I thought that was interesting. Some of the characters we had to explain to people people didn't weren't familiar with them there was a difficulty that i noticed which was that some people had never played in the uh, role playing game so they were used to maybe uh, normal playing cards or conventional games and they had not done role-playing games before, which is when you play, you take on the role of a character. But once they got into the game, I feel like with time, they really got into it. 
and they were really playing their character and they were trying to think like the character really taking on that character as themselves And this happened both at the park and at Villa Lobo, which was when they first heard about the, the blight. Like, what do you do when you first see the blight on the trees? What do you do? Should we touch it? Should we taste it? Like, what should we do? Some people were like, no way, you want to stay away, don't even touch it. And other people were very curious because they, they wanted to know what it was. So, so there was one character, Wirapuru, which is a bird. And the bird went and wanted to taste it with its beak to see if it was going to be good or bad. Uh, because the person with that character said, well, I'm a very curious character. So they look at the traits of the character and maybe the person was also a curious person. And so then we had to say, well, it's an illness. And, you know, then they talked about develop, uh, creating a medication. And then they had to decide if they were going to take the medication or not. In some cases, they didn't want to take the medication. At the park, there was a girl who said, no, I'm going to do a quarantine. I'm going to stay away for 40 days after I take the medication because I don't want to contaminate other people. So I think that's interesting because probably two years ago, to use that term quarantine might have been something that people didn't even know about. And now it's kind of like an automatic thing. Like, oh, if I'm going to be contaminated, I think I need to go under quarantine. Another decision-making point was whether you trust Seju Branco, who was supposed to be a very wise person and a person of great authority, or if you trust Kuka, who is an ambiguous figure, not really that trustworthy. And if they were to trust the wise person, it was one thing. But if they were to go to Kuka, would they just give Kuka the medication? So it's really a matter of like, should we trust somebody that we know is being trustworthy or not? So I thought that was very interesting, just seeing how they made those decisions. And I don't know if Jean wants to say something. Yeah, sure. Okay. So what I noticed is that people were a little bit more hesitant to play the game when I did, which I believe it was a bit different from my group. And actually, people who are experiencing homelessness are, are hesitant to interact because they feel that their opinions might lead to conflict to others. It may lead to actual uh, conflict later. Sometimes they'll be shy about their opinions. And they saw that it was, in a way, a playful activity, but they knew that it could have repercussions to their everyday lives, to their relationship with other people. This is also something that we saw at the Casa da Acolida, at the shelter. Maila, would you like to comment? Maila can't unmute herself. Okay. Oh, somebody unmuted me. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the people who are experiencing homelessness. This, these people, these communities are different for people in the cooperatives, in the favelas, because these are people whose family bonds were broken. These are people who do not own a TV or a cell phone or has or have even the means to take a shower. So the only sources of information these people have is mostly us. It's the groups that serve them. 
We give them the ability to take showers. We give them toiletries. We give them food or we bring them these things, not give them. So these are people who require a lot more stimulation to generate critical thinking. Like Jean said, many were hesitant to speak their minds because they're afraid of conflict. There's a lot of drug consumption. There's a lot of alcohol consumption. Sometimes the reasoning skills are not the sharpest at those particular times. So differently from the workshops, the game worked quite well. And I think using folklore characters were a very good choice for us because no matter where we come from, we all know a little bit about these characters. It was very interesting to see how it worked, stimulating their thought, um, see how they operated, how they understood the weaknesses and strengths in each character so that they could act individually to make sure the game worked. And both of these occasions, both the ones that we did in the square and in the shelter, in both locations where we worked with homeless communities, they had different uh, conclusions. One of the groups decided to take the medicine while the other decided to seek the help of KUKA. So they took different branches in their games. So they were basically very happy to, to join. And I will confess that they were actually happiest about the meals we brought in. Part, and uh, this was most important for the people experiencing homelessness that were not in the shelter, that were actually in the streets because it's food that they do not experience living in the streets. So it was very special for them. And we did see uh, that they were much more, let's say, um, interactive in the game as compared to the workshops. It was much more efficient at bringing them information and helping them with critical thinking. It was more effective at prompting them to ask and to prompt them to question who they should trust less and who they should trust more. It was very interesting. Thank you, Maila. That was quite interesting. Diane, uh, is this your turn again? Yes. Just to finalize what we said, let me just go over here a few of the preliminary results. But before that, Big thank you to uh, Maila and Jean for their uh, comments. It was very, very useful, and they have been very, very useful. So moving forward, yes, we also noticed the hesitancy that Maila discussed, and that's normal because whenever someone is exposed to a game or to an activity for the first time, there's always a lot of hesitation, right? There is a learning curve to be traversed. You need to learn the rules. You need to learn what to be done. And before you do that, you, you kind of, you know, got a bit hesitant about it. But after this very natural hesitancy, people managed to play the game, reach the end of the narrative, and resolve the conflict. And that in itself really is a victory because this is where we see that the process of developing critical thinking has worked. They were able to absorb knowledge speak to their peers, apply innovative solutions, and apply all of those things to an everyday uh, activity or to an everyday dilemma, which is the game. And it was also very interesting to see how the colleagues came up with completely new solutions that we hadn't seen before. We really saw them playing the games and their comments are really, really interesting. Things that we couldn't even anticipate when we created the game. One of the participants actually told us, why don't you take a sample of the blight and send it to a lab? Because he didn't want to touch them. So he had this creative insight and nobody, none of us, when we were playing the game, even considered that as a possibility. Another very interesting uh, thing we saw is how much they brought issues from their own everyday lives into the game narrative they would see characters and immediately associate them, associate them with a politician or somebody they saw in the news. Some of them said, no, 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 the game is telling us to cut the trees, but deforesting is wrong. We shouldn't do that. Let's do something else. Let's try to find another path. And this was really gratifying for us. It was really interesting for us to see how we were able to bring something interesting to people, how we could bring something playful for people. 
and how how we helped people actually have a little bit of escape valve and help them produce their own realities. Oh, sorry, uh, a little bit of a rest from their realities. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Okay, so I think we've now given a, a good overview of all the strategies we used, the activities we developed, and the materials we used. So now moving on to training and dissemination. The first uh, strategy we had was to meet or to have meetings with the local researchers to disseminate the practices and to basically train them. And if, I think that they may be able to talk a little bit this, uh, talk about this a little more than I can, because, but I believe that on the first week, they were a little bit more comfortable because we were there with them. But then when we did the second round of workshops, when we were there to support them, but they were supposed to be alone, things changed a little bit, I guess. The idea of leaving them unaccompanied to apply these workshops is exactly to understand whether it is possible to do these rounds of workshops without um, Ernest, Laura, if you can actually uh, bring up the pictures. I think you can see here the different materials. Like this is for instance, the handbook that we use for all the meetings. Uh, here, the handbooks also has instructions on how to apply the game. It includes the cards. You see the cards there. And also, actually, we have this material available for download. If you want to check it on a website, we have it all public. We're also doing events to publicize the project. This is actually the first one of them, and we'll continue to do them. And the idea is to be able to multiply all the good things that we did uh, empowering these people to awaken their critical thinking and to make sure that these other communities can enjoy as well. And now I'd like to give the floor to Claudia so she can talk a little bit about the project's impact. Claudia, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you everybody for wonderful presentations and accounts of the project. Um, so, we, you know now where we are, not only where we are in the project, but where we are physically in our web page. And as Michael said, we are beginning to um, upload all materials, our public domain, and all materials will be available. Um, we are we continue to analyze the results of the, the, the data that we got from implementing the workshops and the game. We also were able to capture um, testimonies of some of the participants. So we are trying to really um, ascertain, did this matter to you? What, what, what change, if any, did it make on the way in which you approach or you make decisions or whatnot? So it is very interesting to be listening and what people had to say um, about the experience. Um, we continue to also analyze the interactions in the conversation circles as well as in the games and the interviews. So we are at the point where we are transcribing, analyzing and writing about. One thing was to be in the field first to conceptualize the project, then to be in the field implementing, but we want everyone to know that this uh, exists, that this can have a good impact on people, and we really would like to offer it to the world to replicate. So um, on the one hand, we are so, so grateful of what we could do. Time went really quickly. It was during the pandemic in one year that we were able to obtain the data, conceptualize the project, do the materials, implement them, collect the data and analyze. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in um, like peeling an onion and different layers of complexity in what we are learning and what we can do. Um, I think those um, those analyses are the most important ones because we, we will get to see the impact on people. And as Michael said, through our webpage, through um, more conferences, and most importantly, 
through the work done in the field by the local researchers, it is our hope that the project will not finish when the grant finishes and that it can take on and that we can keep this communication, this this um, these channels that we have opened with, with our groups, with the local researchers to continue having conversations on how are things going for you one month from now, six months from now, a year from now, and that we can find new funding to implement more of this in different areas. So I think that's all I, I want to say in terms of um, analyzing impact. Impact is going to be measured by did it make a difference in people's lives? And, and those are the ones that we really want to, to get hold of. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We're now going into the last uh, section of our presentation. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping. This is the website of the project. If you would like to here, uh, if you get to know a little bit more the website, it, this it has .uk, but it's in Portuguese and English. It's a bilingual website. And I'm also going to invite you to visit. If you can't write it down right now, don't worry, just get in touch with us. We can provide the link later. And finally, give thanks. Let me begin by thanking first and foremost, the UKRI which is the organization who really financed this project, the organization that allowed this project to be run, particularly its Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is the body of the UKRI to which we presented our research proposal and which accepted it. Let me also thank the entire team at Harriet Watt, the Scottish University I mentioned, especially Claudia, who led the entire team on the British side and uh, who actually led the works and who led this partnership that we had and who was an important person in allowing for all this learning that we had throughout this year. Actually, on November 1st, we just reached the first anniversary of the project. And thank you for all the learning throughout this time. Thank you also to the uh, UFG team, Diane, Jay-Z, Lucas, everybody from the UFG who provided us support to go to the field to work with us, really. They really helped us build these links with the local community, with everything. Also, these three institutions in the middle here were essential. Without our close relationships with, relationships with these three, it would have been impossible to have a project that had all the impact that this one had because they were so useful. We would send the materials and they always gave us back feedback so that we could improve our materials. They were really, really helpful. Thank you, Maila, Jovi, and everybody from Tio Cleobaldo, Melissa and Edvan from Kufa, and Lorena and Daniel from Coparama which is one of the only 40 cooperatives with, in which we work. And also like to thank uh, the interpreters, Daniel and Elena, for all the support they provided throughout our meetings. They made our dialogue so much easier and they, were, they really helped get the project to where it is now. So our thanks to them. And Funapi, uh, here represented by Brenner. And it's the foundation that interface with the British side to really allow this. So Brenner really um, helped. And I'm now going to, and this is our Q&A time. After all the thanks, please feel free to ask questions. If anybody uh, from our audience would like to ask a question, if anybody has any comments to make, including from the team as well. So the floor is open for questions, everybody. Thank you all. And if, I, if we can stop sharing the screen so we can go back to the gallery view. Okay. If, if, if you can, everybody, if you, if you can change to gallery view so we can see everybody. All right. The floor is open. If anybody has questions or comments, feel free. Michael, can I make a comment? Uh, 
I think there was something really important that we could see in the project as we run it. And I'm not here talking about all the general aspects. It goes beyond just bringing things to the communities. And I mean, really, the opportunity that we had to provide training and education to our local researchers, Myla, Daniel, Lorena, this training aspect of our research project is absolutely fundamental. We did not look at these people simply as a source of data. We look at them as really, really part of a research project. They really got involved with the project, not just to get trained on what they needed to do, but also to get trained on how a research project really works. And for me, this relationship was one of the most important aspects all of all the project. So I'd like to, I really wanted to put it on the record. All of you were an important part of this project. Your daily experiences was incredibly important. Your daily interactions with the communities were all essential. Thank you. Cool, Jaza. Yes, I agree. Jaza, I have a question from Camilla. How are things going to work moving forward? Do you plan to implement the project in other places and locations, even in other countries? So that's one of the questions. Okay, so I'll begin to answer that one. And then if anybody wants to uh, chip in, feel free. So Camilla, this is a pilot program. The idea was for us to create this communicative strategy. And this is what we're doing now. Specifically, we're now validating the strategy and we're thinking of what can be perfected, what can be uh, difficult further on, what challenges we may face. For instance, one difficulty we found is that sometimes we plan activities in a certain level of uh, volume and then we, we need to have to cut a few activities to prioritize others because there's not enough time. There were instances, for instance, in which we thought the language was the right one, but then it wasn't. We had to explain things more than we had planned. So we're going to look into all of this to the strategy as a whole and try to reshape things to conform to these issues and move forward. And the idea, yes, it is to replicate. We want to multiply this, particularly with the organizations that work inside those communities. And then of course, Claudia can talk more about how the plans can be for replicating this internationally. But at the national level, we, we do have plans to disseminate what we developed so that with the proper adaptations, other sites can apply as well. Claudia, would you like to comment? Sure, thank you, Michael. Um, I think that it's it's a very important question, the question of, of replicating and how we are going to do it. Um, and I think um, it's by providing a prototype, is by analyzing what we did, as Michael said, tweaking what worked, what didn't work, and always remembering that what works in one place may need adjustments in the other. And that depending on the person, the approach is the um, moderation of a game or the moderation of a workshop, depending on the experience, um, et cetera, that will vary too. So we need to offer a kind of prototype that will allow the user of a different area to localize it to, so that there are general principles that we explain to the person who's going to take this on in a different place, why things are in the way they are done rather than in, in another way, because there's there's a reason for why we are doing how what we are doing and in the way we are doing it. And then um, understanding that it all starts with, with the person who's in front of us, that without the us, there is nothing, there is no project. So it starts with the community and ends with the community. So it's not also a matter of replicating exactly but it's a matter of localizing according to the needs of each community. So offering guidelines and prototypes and offering our experience in how we deviated from things at certain points or how we emphasize more what we 
in in situ at the moment we thought it was necessary so um i think what what we haven't told you is also that the group did a lot of reflection and we reflected together and we engaged in very long conversations and very um important conversations and we reflected apart we worked every week we met for two hours one hour we promised our interpreters it was going to be one hour it ended up being longer than one hour and that creates fatigue on interpreters so we are forever grateful for how they have walked this walk with us in the same way as the local researchers have engaged with us and trained with us and it, it was not just training in one way, we were learning tons from the local researchers. So I think we we went into this project with this vision of a participatory action research, really a socially committed group that's going to try and do something, not just giving to the communities, receiving from the community so much as we did. So our thinking processes and our knowledge of how to do things has grown exponentially thanks to the experience that we have had. And our goal is to for this not to stay here with us or with these communities, but replicate it. And it will happen in different areas of Brazil and it will happen in different countries by through translation, through multilingualism, engaging, translanguaging in the same way that we've done between Portuguese, Spanish and English, because it, we didn't have a common language, all of us. So... And we could do it, so it it can easily through through these ways be transferred into other areas too. I think the key thing in here is how do we do it in the sense of where do we get the funding that we got for this first one to continue to continue to grow? Because we we need to be able to afford giving back to the community if we ask them for time, be able to offer something in return, and, and that requires funding. So that, that's where our um, goal is now too. It's, we know we have something meaningful, we, it's being validated as we are uh, presenting in other places or discussing with others, and we need to be able to sustain it, and, and we need to be able to, to offer um, help and offer time to the local researchers that they're taking off their time and giving. So we are super, super grateful for everybody. Thank you, Michael. We have another comment here from Tiago. He says, congratulations to everyone for the research, for the project. I think it's fundamental information. Oh, I think that having that scientific and popular Training is fundamental right now. <clears throat> and then Jill said, or asked, in addition to the four dimensions of information competency, the technical, aesthetic, ethical, and political, did you identify other things that could be worked on with other dimensions? I don't know if Jaza or Claudia want to answer that. So, in addition to the technical, aesthetic, ethical, and political, knowledge competencies or in terms of is there other skills or competencies that you were able to identify and work on um i think i i will start and and jace i'm sure um you have a lot to say too um i was looking for my hand to put it up but then i ended up putting up the, the real hand um the um the the dimension of affect and emotions uh one of the things that we were um we we were all very moved by having like the opportunity to enter the field. And I talk from here, from the UK, but I was really uh, so grateful to have conversations with, with everybody in the team, with Lorena, with Myla, with Edvan, with Danielle, with Raisa, and, and getting really excited when we were working together in workshops. I think um, we, in the in the project, we have covered the four dimensions that you discuss in terms of information competence, but there is the emotional part too, that um, allowed participants through the activities to start talking about their own feelings or their own beliefs or their own. And I think it's very important to tap on that one because it's at the core of how we make decisions. And um, and so that's that's the one that comes to mind immediately. And there, there may be others, yeah. 
So you say you want to pitch in. I think in terms of what you said, I had I had thought of the same thing in terms of affection or emotions. You know, sometimes we go into some communities as a researcher and we are surprised. We're surprised by how people deal with things and how they respond to us. So that was also a big surprise for us. And then really related to what you said, I think looking at affection and care, that's what I was most touched by. It impressed me a lot. But that was it. The same comment. Well, we are at time. So if everyone, if anyone has any other questions, you can contact us. You can look at our website. There's the event site and our website. Those are two separate websites. You can find our contact information there. We have one at Harriet Wad and one at UF, UFG. You can also find us at Tio Cleobaldo, Tio Cleobaldo, Coparama, Kufa. At this event today, we wanted to share a little bit about our experience and just, just network a little bit, socialize a little bit. So I wanna thank everyone again, everyone who's been involved with this project. I think this is a, it's a very beautiful project, not just scientifically, but I think socially as well. Personally, I'm not from the area of information or communication, but I work a lot with these communities. So I've learned a lot in the last year, and I'm very happy with what I've learned. And we continue to do our work. We're still doing it. So please follow our work, and you can find out even more. Again, thanking you for your presence and earnest. I don't know if we could get a gallery view so that we can see everyone. Just reminding Michael that the gallery view, as far as I know, is just each person sets it. I wanna thank everyone, all the institutions, those of you who are here who have spent the last two hours with us, and we're here for any questions. Have a keep taking care of yourself. The pandemic is still ongoing, and we will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Till next time. Thank you very much. Bye. And thank you, interpreters. Great job.